graphed rectangular coordinates. Oh, so the regular old graph that you've worked with your whole life, the x-axis, the y-axis, we call that the rectangular coordinate plane, okay, rectangular. So when I'm talking about rectangular, I'm talking about the old-fashioned x, y points and that kind of thing. Polar plane, the polar coordinate plane, looks a little different and we graph a little bit differently, but that there's also some similarities, so we're going to talk about that. Um, but to give you an idea of why we have another way of graphing, like what was wrong with the old way? Well, think about this. It's like um, directional. If I were going to drive, if I have to go to Countryside Mall right now, okay, um, I would go out to my car and I would have to follow certain roads, right? I'd have to go out, take a left, get to the light, take a right, curve around. You know, I have a path I have to follow. Just like when you graph on the coordinate plane, pretend this is just the X, Y axis. If I want to get to Countryside Mall, which is right here, I would start here and I would have to go to the right and then I would have to go up. You have to follow those rules of maneuvering around the coordinate plane, right? We go left or right and then up and down. What's nice about polar coordinates is you start in the middle, just like you do with graphs, but you get to go straight to it. You don't have to follow the road. So it's like if I want to go to Countryside Mall and I could fly there, okay? I could just go up in the air and fly and skip over all those turns. This is used in a lot of aviation and, and boating and flying and things like that, okay? So a polar coordinate system is a system to plot points in a plane with a point O at the center. That O is also called the pole or the origin. Just like we do with rectangular, we call this the origin or the pole. Since that's a new word, I'm just going to call it the pole to get you used to it. The polar axis is the horizontal ray from O pole, or origin, to the right. So let me show you. It starts here, and it goes out this way. That is your polar axis. Remember what the word ray means? Ray has an endpoint and an arrow. So it doesn't go in two directions. The polar axis is not like the x-axis, that's the whole left to right, okay? It's just from here to here. Polar coordinates are in the form radius theta. So instead of x, y, or in trig, we used cosine sine. We use r and theta. Okay. R is the directed distance from zero to P. So directed means it's going in a specific direction. Distance, we know what that means. But that would be from here to here is called your radius. Theta is your directed angle in a counterclockwise direction from polar axis to segment OP right here. So like right there, right here. And so this should be giving you um, unit circle vibes. The only difference is we called this hypotenuse. We called it one because that is a unit circle. But it's really the radius also of a circle. You can think of it as a hypotenuse of a right triangle. They're all interchangeable. Okay. Now we're going to write two things here that won't make sense until um, I graph with you here. But go ahead and, and write now so we're not waiting. Um, and I promise to explain them um, when I graph, but let's have it written down first. So if R is greater than zero, meaning positive, right? If radius is positive, P, our point, lies on the terminal side of theta. Stay with me, I promise to come back to that concept. And if R is less than zero, fancy talk for negative, if the radius is negative, P lies on the ray opposite the terminal side of theta. It means nothing to you right now. I understand this. I'm going to explain it. Okay, so here's the easiest way I really do think to learn how to, these are really easy. Once, once I go through these four, I think you'll totally have it. Um, but I have my own little like sayings and ways of helping you understand these, okay? And I call this the hover method, all right? So in, in 
what I want you to see now, let's dissect what these graphs look like, okay? We have that polar axis, and so you almost have what looks like the X and the Y axis, so you can kind of think of it like that. Um, we have concentric circles, one, two, three in this case. It can go out to however many. They can be really close together, but that's your radii. That's how far your radius, like from here to here is a radius. From here to here would be a radius of that circle. From here to here would be the radius of that circle, right? From the center to an end point on the circle. That's what R is, okay? So you count these circles. This would be radius one, radius two, radius three, all the way around, okay? Then we have, let's just look at quadrant one. The way these polar graphs are made, and I've seen all different ones where there's more lines in the, you know, in there. Maybe there's three lines, maybe there's more. But bottom line is this, think of the unit circle because these quadrants are broken down into the thetas just like on the unit circle. And we have three standard angles in each quadrant, right? The denominator of six, denominator of four, denominator of three. Well, there's, if you remember, it's like 30, 15, 15, 30. So this is your pi over six and this is your pi over three. Okay, where's pi over four? Right in the middle. They didn't give us a line for it, but that's okay. It's like when you've had to graph like 1.5 on a regular rectangular coordinate plane. You sometimes are in between two lines and then you have to graph a decimal. Same thing, we're gonna put pi over four right in the middle, okay? So you wanna be aware of how your polar um, quadrants are broken up. So they gave us two lines, we know there'd be one more in between them and that would be our pi over four, okay? So here's what you do. You go out two circles towards pi over four, okay? So I know pi over four is gonna be right in the middle of those two. I start at the pole, always, and I go out one, two. That's it, that's point P. That is it. Now, why is that so easy? It is easy, okay? Um, but notice everything's positive here. Glance ahead at B, C, and D. We have to do some moving around when the, either one of those are negative. Really, really simple. But let me go, now go back to that definition I set up here. If R is greater than zero, which is the case here, right? This is that first scenario. P lies on the terminal side of theta. Okay, so we don't, we don't ever have to draw this. I'm just drawing it so you can see what that really looks like. Right, the terminal side of theta. The, and the last one where it ends. We did terminal side on the coordinate plane before when we were graphing. Um, so this we call this the initial side where you start and the terminal side. How far open is your angle, okay? So that's called the terminal side. So that's the point. You don't draw all of that. You literally just draw the point. Remember, these are quick and fast. So you're just going right to your point most of the time, right? Stay with me. Let's do another one. Now, don't even worry about anything being negative. The first thing you do, and I call it, like I said, the hover method, is I'm gonna go exactly where, if these were positive. So pretend everything's positive. So pi over three would be up here. Remember, your denominators of three are the ones that are around the y-axis, and that's quadrant one. So I know that's pi over three, and then my r is one. So if, notice I'm gonna pick up my pencil. If one was positive, this would be my point. Notice it's in pencil, I'm erasing it here in a second. It's not positive, so something is going to change here. So you'll hear me, this is how I like to teach it. I'll say, okay, I'm going to go to one pi over three. Do I get to stay here? No. The answer is no. How do I know the answer is no? I've got a negative going on here. I have to make a move. The, the, so this is where r is less than zero. The ray opposite this is right exactly through the origin. Whenever you have a negative theta, sorry, a negative radius, you'll hear me say you just shoot right through the origin. We're on the opposite side. So again, if I drew that same picture before, as before, that's my terminal side. The ray opposite the ter terminal side is exactly half a unit circle away. An easy way of saying it is just shooting through the x-axis. This is our point that is Okay. Letter C, you have negative 30. I have negative pi over six. Guess what? They're the same thing. 30 degrees is the first angle you come to on the unit circle. It's also pi over six. One's degrees, one's radius. Okay, 
So remember, we always start out hovering at where any everything's positive, okay? So if, if pi over six was my angle, that would be right here, and I would go out three circles. One, two, three. So if pi over six was positive, I would make a point right here and walk away. But I don't get to stay here, do I? Because I have a negative theta. Let's remember how I taught you the easiest thing in the world about negative angles is whatever quadrant you're in, one, two, three, or four, you go to the positive one, you cross the x-axis to get to the negative, okay? Doesn't matter if I'm at the top, if I'm in quadrant one or two, and I wanna to get to the negative angle, I go to the bottom. If I'm in quadrant three or four, and I wanna to get to that angle's negative, I go up. You always cross the x-axis, no matter where you start. So, if this is pi over six, negative pi over six is exactly the same distance in reverse, which is crossing the x-axis. So, I, let's start over. I go out three circles to pi over six. Do I get to stay here? No. no. My theta is negative. I cross the x-axis. There is my point. Okay? So, cross x-axis. And if you want to write here, I don't know um, if it helps you, shoot through the Okay. So if they're both positive, you go right to where it is, you're done. If the radius is negative, you shoot through the origin. We're going to practice more, don't worry. And if you have a negative theta, you cross the x-axis. Okay. Now, what do you do if both of them are negative? You do both things. And guess what? It doesn't matter what order you do them in. It doesn't matter at all. So let's see. Pretend everything's positive. 7 pi over 6, that would be quadrant 3, right? I know it quickly because the numerator is one more than the denominator. My denominators of 6 are around the x-axis, right? So this is pi over 6. This is negative 7 pi over 6. This would be whatever. All right, so let's go to where, what am I doing? No, that's positive 7 pi. Sorry, that's positive 7 pi over 6, so sorry. So that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to go out two circles to 7 pi over 6. Do I get to stay here? Definitely not. I have to make two moves because I have two negatives. You can do either one first. I'll show you both, okay? If I do the two negative first, what do I do when the radius is negative? Shoot through the origin. So I'm at two positive 7 pi over 6, but to make a, the, the radius negative, I would shoot right through the origin and I would end up right here. Do I get to stay there? Nope. Nope, I have a negative theta. What do I do? I drop and cross the x-axis and that would be point S. Let me show you the other way. Start the pull, go to where everybody's positive. Do I get to stay? No. Let's this time do the angle first. When my angle is negative, I cross the x-axis. That would put me here. Okay, so positive 2, positive 7 pi over 6 is right here. But positive 2, negative 7 pi over 6 would be right here. But I don't get to stay there because I have a negative radius. So I would shoot through the origin and land here. So it doesn't matter which one you do first. Either one. So however many negatives you have is how many moves you're going to have to make from your original hovering position. Okay? And we'll practice this. This is one through six in your homework, which is half of your homework. And I'm hoping we get to those together. First period, we did them all together. Second period, the bell rang before we got to one of them. All right. So let's go on to second of three types of problems we're doing. First of all, let's cross that craziness out. I'm going to cross that out. I'm making my own notes here. I don't even understand that formula. That makes no sense to me. All right, so what we're going to do here is plot this point and find three, nope, we're going to find four additional polar representations of this point. Because what's really nice is if we're talking about the, the rectangular coordinate, coordinate plane, you plot a point, that's the name of the point. You can't name it something else. It's a positive and a positive. You're in quadrant one. There's no other way to name it. But with polar coordinates, think about it. We just showed ways of like being able to cross through the x-axis or the origin 
x-axis um, coterminal angles. You can add and subtract 2 pi forever. Let me show you what I mean. So what we're going to do, let's start out by, by um, graphing this. Pretend everything's positive. It is. And go to 2 pi over 3. 2 pi over 3, the numerator is 1 less than the denominator. That's quadrant 2. And my denominators of 3 are closest to the y-axis. So this right here would be 2 pi over 3. So I'm going to go ahead and graph that. Go out two circles, one, two. Do I get to stay here? Yes. There's no negatives. Okay? So that's plotting that point. Now, I want to name it four additional ways. Let me show you the first two. You can keep your radius positive. Let's put a plus in front of it just to make a point. Keep the radius positive and add and subtract 2 pi. Remember, coterminal, if we add 2 pi or subtract 2 pi, and we could do that forever and ever. We could add another 2 pi and another 2 pi and another 2 pi forever and ever and keep landing on the same spot. It would have a different name here, but it would be that same point on the graph. Okay, so let's, let's do that. So I would have two points. In both cases, I'm keeping my radius positive. I'm going to add 2 pi. I'm going to subtract 2 pi to my theta. So I have 2 pi over 3, and I want to add 2 pi to it. So I know I need a denominator of 3. What would my numerator be to make a 2 pi? Yeah. 6 divided by 3 is 2. So 6 pi over 3 is 2 pi. That would be 8 pi over 3. Done. That's going out two circles and around another time to get to 8 pi over 3. Do the same thing, but subtract 6 pi over 3. That's just going the other direction, clockwise. We get a negative angle. Okay. We can have negative angles. Let me just show you why this is the same, why this is the same as this, okay? I'm going to show you. So I would go out to positive 4 pi over 3. Positive 4 pi over 3 is right here. Do I get to stay? No. My, um, no, I keep doing this. 4 pi over 3 is right here. Where is negative 4 pi over 3? Right here, across the x-axis. So this is in the same place as that. Again, go to 4 pi over 3, cross the x-axis. That would end up right at the same place. And remember, this is 4 pi over 3. Gosh. I'm trying to rush. This is 4 pi over 3. Go out two circles. Where is negative 4 pi over 3? Cross the x-axis. It will be in the same exact place, same denominator, but in the quadrant above the x-axis. Okay? So, so far, we have done two um, like that. A second way of doing it is making your r negative and adding and subtracting just pi. I'll prove to you why. Let's do the math first. So we would have negative 2 something, negative 2 something. So I'm at 2 pi over 3, and I'm going to add pi. Well, pi is the easiest one in, of all of them to get a common denominator. It would just be 3 pi over 3. Right? That equals pi. And subtract pi. And I'll show you why these work. These two are also in that same exact spot. Here's why. 5 pi over 3 is here. So I go out to 5 pi over 3, 2 circles. Do I get to stay? No. Radius is negative. I shoot through the origin, and I end up right back. Okay. Pi over 3 is here. So if I go pi over 3, pi over 3, two circles, do I get to stay? Nope. I have a negative radius, shoot through the origin. I have a negative angle, cross the x-axis. Okay. So all four of these, well, we could say five, are all that same exact point, just different representations. This is one way of finding two of them. This is a way of finding another two. And you could keep going, adding another pi, 
now they're probably subtracting as many times as you want because it's coterminal. Co but in the homework, it says find two additional. So you pick whatever two you want to do. Okay. All right, last concept. You're going to, one of the big things we're doing in, in this section is toggling between rectangular world and polar world and vice versa. You're going to be given polar coordinates and you're going to have to change them to rectangular or given <laughs> rectangular changing to polar. To do that, we need these really important four formulas. We actually will use these formulas many, many, many times because instead of doing coordinates, tomorrow we actually do equations, changing equations back and forth. So here's these four equations. And you might be like, oh my gosh, she's giving us more equations, more things to remember. Well, these are really, really, really easy. Let me explain to you. Let me draw you guys a right triangle. Quadrant one's an easy one. Okay. We have labeled right triangles in this class so many different ways, and we are certainly not done. But understand all the different things we've called these. Like in geometry, it was A, B, and C, right? For A squared plus B squared equals C squared. You could call it cosine and sine and one. Like that's what we did with um, unit circle and trig. Well, we can also kind of mix a few of them together. We could call this X, right, and this Y like your ordered pair, how do we get to that point, to the right x up y, and we could call this the radius. So if I use that, those labels of a right triangle, that's where these formulas come from. Let me show you real quick. If I asked you what is cosine of theta of this triangle, cosine is adjacent. We're calling the adjacent side x over hypotenuse. Remember, a over h. We're just using new names. This side is called X, my adjacent side. This, call, my hypotenuse, is called R. Then get the R out of your denominator. Multiply both sides by R. You get R cosine theta equals X. That's this. So X equals R cosine theta. Same exact process here. What is sine of theta in this triangle? Sine is opposite. We called it Y over hypotenuse, we called it R. You don't have to do this formula, I'm just showing you where it came from. And I get R sine theta equals Y, okay? They're identical formulas. X or Y equals the radius, which is the same number for both of them, and then X and cosine go together, Y and sine go together, okay? Don't worry about memorizing, when do I use this one? When do I use it? You won't have to. I'm gonna prove it to you in a second. So don't even read number one or two. We're just gonna get familiar with these formulas and I'll show you how, why. Um, what does this equation give you vibes of? X squared plus Y squared equals R squared. What does that kind of feel like? Pythagorean, right? Look at this triangle. X squared plus Y squared equals R squared. That's Pythagorean theorem. And tan is adjacent Oh, sorry, opposite over adjacent, sine over co so many different ways we've called this. Tan is opposite over adjacent. Y is also known as sine over cosine. So tan is Y over X. And we've even used that in the past. So how do we use these formulas? Let me show you. We are given polar coordinates here. This is R, this is theta. We want to change it to rectangular, which is X and Y. Put this next thing I'm going to write somewhere important. Highlight it, star it, something. Whenever we are working with rectangular anything, coordinates, equations, the only variables you'll ever have are x and y, right? Algebra. We use x's and y's. Think of slope-intercept form, point-slope form, standard form of a parabola, ax squared plus bx plus c. A, b, and c are numbers, but you have x's and y's in your equation. In polar, you're always going to have r's and thetas. So that is going to be a really, really helpful concept in knowing what do I have, what do I need, how do I get it. I have r's and thetas, I need x's and y's. So for this first one, I'm going to use the first two formulas. It's the only formula that utilizes what I have. We have an r and a theta, we can plug those in, and an r and a theta here, and get your X and your Y that you need, okay? 
So x is going to be r cosine theta, y will be r sine theta. r is 3 for both of them, right? Given, right here. We need to know our unit circle. 5 pi over 6 is a denominator of 6, so we start with the square root of 3 over 2, 1 half, right? Denominators of 6 always start with that. This is quadrant 2 because the numerator is 1 less than the denominator, so that makes this guy negative. Don't forget what you know. That first term is cosine, the second is sine. This is cosine, sine, cosine, sine. So cosine of 5 pi over 6 is negative square root of 3 over 2. Sine of 5 pi over 6 is 1 half. Put it all together. And there is your ordered pair. Now, something that is really cool is if I graphed 3, 5 pi over 6 on one of my circle graphs, polar graph, and I graphed this xy ordered pair on a regular rectangular graph, and I put them right on top of each other, they'd be at the same exact place on their corresponding coordinate plane. Okay? They are in the same place in the four quadrants. Okay? They're just named differently, and the way we travel to them is differently. different. Okay? Let's do another one. R and theta, we need x and y. Okay? So x equals radius times cosine of that. Y will be radius times sine of 7 pi over 6. So negative 7 pi over 6, think about it, where is positive 7 pi over 6? Right here, cross the x-axis, here. So this is 5 pi over 6, also known as negative 7 pi over 6. Same ordered pair we just used in the last problem, ironically. Okay. And last problem, going from rectangular to polar. Rectangular to polar. We have x and y. We need r and theta. So without having to memorize what formula goes with what, think about what you have. I have x and y, and I need r and theta. This is when we're going to use the other one. Like, there's, no ch there's not a chance of you using the wrong formula because you don't have the information needed to plug into these two. I have x and y. That's not going to give me r and theta. But if I do x and y here, I can get r. If I plug in x and y here, I'm going to find theta. So basically, Pythagorean theorem. x squared plus y squared equals radius squared. 1 plus 1 is 2. And guys, we're on the unit circle. Our radius is a hypotenuse, and our hypotenuse is always positive. So don't worry about ever getting a negative R in these. Okay. And then tan, let's see, this one's a little bit, this is probably the trickier one. So it's y over x, given to us, y over x, negative 1 over 1 is negative 1. And remember, we're trying to find theta, so we're trying to find the angle. The question, the way you kind of ask yourself, is where on the unit circle is tan negative 1? What's the denominator for all my tans of 1? Not 2. Remember, we have square roots of 3, we have square roots of 3 over 3, and we have 1s. 
come on guys, the denominators of four, and when you put square root of two over two over square root of two over two, they cancel out and you get one. So you're gonna get one or negative one at all your denominators of four. Here's the problem, not really a problem, but there's two positives, all students take, all and take, they're positive there, and one is negative here and here. So we have to narrow it down. Is it gonna be in quadrant two or is it gonna be in quadrant four? Remember what I said, that the ordered pair on the rectangular coordinate plane and the ordered pair that we're about to find on the polar coordinate plane, if I cut them out and put them on top of each other, they lay right on top of each other. That means this point is in what quadrant? To the right one, down one, that's quadrant what? Four. That means beta is in quadrant four as well. So at five, we go to seven, 11. There is the polar there is the rectangular. Got to know our unit circle, guys. Got to remember our tan tricks. Denominators of four give us a tan of one or negative one. The question is, what, what's the theta where tan is negative one? Where does this happen? Theta at seven pi or four, we have a tan of negative one. Okay, x squared plus y squared equals radius square squared. And then here we go again dealing with this tan of theta equals zero over two. Can we skip that step and go right to zero, right? Y over x. 0 over 2 is 0. So the question is, where is tan 0? So that means it's going to be 0 over something. But without having to think too hard about your unit circle, let's use what we know about this point. That point would be right here, right? 2, 0 is right there. What is the angle that's in that same place? 0. 0 or 0 pi. You can write either one. And it's kind of confusing when they just write zero here because it looks like it's the same thing. But you will see just zero written as a zero pi. Because remember, your rectangular point and your polar, your angle, are in the same exact place in the four quadrants. All right, I just threw a ton of information at you. And we didn't even finish day one. But I'm hoping you guys will see. I'm going to do one through six with you right now. Yeah, our pages are a little different. Um, someone have a page for me? But I think you have these problems. If I looked at Amanda's correctly. Okay, but do you have those problems? That's what matters. I don't care about the page number. Look on the, are they just out of order? Amanda, how come you have it? Okay, they're, they're, I think your pages are copied out of order or something, but you have all of these problems, okay? Look carefully, it's on the next page, okay? Your pages are not in order, but you do have all these problems. Okay, right? I just looked at Amanda's. Amanda, didn't you have these? Have 15 through 17. Okay, well, I don't know where 16 and 17 are for you guys, but I guess it's not fair. <laughs> so let's just go to 15. Oh, wait. 
You know, 14. Dang it. I don't know what happened to your notes, guys. And I don't know why some people have sons and it's weird. Because they make them all at the same time, the packets. I'm not saying you're lying. I see. I'm just saying I don't understand. All right, guys, bottom line is let's do one through six right now. Okay, so here's the assignment that everyone should have. Right, Sabine, you have those? This one, this one? That's, yeah, that's for tomorrow. Okay. But, It's really weird. Well, the good thing is, guys, we didn't see this happen. It's not like this happened throughout the year. Like, they didn't mess up our copying, like, all year. So that's good. It looks like we're down to 7 through 10. All. All. One through ten. Thank you. One through ten. All. Oh. One through ten. All. Oh. Okay. I missed all the excitement. All right. Let's start. One through ten. And so, one of the types of problems, two of the types of problems that we did in our notes are not in your homework. Great. Awesome. Love it. Okay. So, let's let's practice plotting points. This is a really important concept. We have to know how to do it. So. We go, for, and you guys have to know your unit circle, okay? This test is not going to be open note. We have to know that 4 pi over 3 is in quadrant what? 3. We should know that the second we look at it, you guys. If the numerator is 1 more than the denominator, that's quadrant 3. And the denominator is 3, that puts our angle at the y-axis. Remember, denominators of 6 hug the x-axis, denominators of um, 3 hug the y-axis. So we go out four circles, one, two, three, four. Do I get to stay here? Yep, because everybody's positive. Those are our favorite. Five pi over six, what quadrant? Quick. Two. The numerator is one less than denominator. Denominator, one less than denominator is quadrant two. And our denominators of six are by the, um, sorry, x-axis. So this would be five pi over six right here. I go out two circles. Do I get to stay there? No. My radius is negative. I shoot through the origin and go exactly the same distance, still be on circle two, just in the opposite but diagonal. Okay. Three pi over four, that's quadrant two, right in the middle. So three pi over four would be like around here. Go out three circles to three pi over four. Do I get to stay there? No, I have to. I have a negative theta, so I'm going to drop over the x-axis. So one, two, three, drop over the x-axis. Now, when you're trying to figure out where to go, you're still going to be three circles out. And if I was in the middle of those two lines in quadrant two, I'm in the middle of those two lines when I cross the x-axis. It's the same exact spot, just either above or below. All right, five pi over three, the difference between the numerator and denominator is more than one, so that's quadrant four. Denominators of three are closest to the y-axis, so positive five pi over three is here. Remember, we graph as if everything's positive to begin with. So I go out five circles to five pi over three. I don't get to stay there, though. I can do either move, it doesn't matter which one I do first, but I have to make two moves. So if I do the negative R, that shoots me through the center. So I was in quadrant four, I'm now in quadrant two. But I don't get to stay there either because I have a negative angle. Negative angle, I cross the x-axis and I would end up here. 
And remember, either you can do either move first. As long as you make two moves, that's all that matters. Three pi over two, down here. Yep, yep, so right, yep. No, there's no, there's no negatives. Oh, six, yes. Negative one what? Because the ordered pair is E2. Tan is Y over X. That equals one. Yeah, but no, we got negative. Well, because one of these was negative. Oh, but then how do you get seven power with four? Because it, it was in quadrant four. Oh. So I knew that that was the. So a quadrant. I know my denominator is four because of the one. Okay. Yeah. And then because it's in quadrant four, five, seven. Yes. Ay yeah yeah. That's a long. By the way, so the rest of the packet, it skips two pages for the rest of the...